All right, first up are the pre-Socratic philosophers, and there are quite a few of them. So what I'm going to do here is list their names and then give a brief summary of their accomplishments or contributions towards philosophic thought. First up are the Milesians, Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes. Thales is considered by many to be the world's first philosopher and scientist. There's a story that says that at one time Thales was mocked for his study of philosophy. So one day after watching the sky and realizing that there would be a large olive crop later that year, Thales bought up all of the olive presses in town, very cheaply, because there was no demand. Sure enough, later that year, everyone needed the olive presses, and so with what I imagine was an incredibly smug look on his face, Thales got to rent them all out at whatever price he wanted. He made a huge profit and showed everyone that his philosophy wasn't a waste of time, he just didn't care about money. Now, the core of Thales' belief system was that the source of all things was water, and that the earth sat upon a vast sea of indefinite extent. And when the earth shook, it was because the water moved, and the water was capable of spontaneous movement because it was alive. Next up is Anaximander. He was credited with making the first maps and discovering equinoxes and solstices. He also realized that Thales' explanation of the world made no sense. Of the four primordial elements, water was wet, earth dry, fire hot, and air cool. And if any one of them were unbounded of indefinite extent, the origin, then they would overpower the other elements. In Thales' view of the world, everything would be water. There wouldn't be fire, air, or earth. Rather, Anaximander posited that the source was something unique, identified as the unbounded, in the sense that it was uniformly indefinite. It contained all the warring opposites of the elements, which, when separated out, pushed violently against each other. His view appears to have been inspired somewhat by the seasonal cycle, or the cycle of day and night. Day, or summer, hot and dry, pushes into the territory of night, or winter, cold and wet, and night, or winter, responds in kind. In this way, the opposites war against each other, and push back and forth, creating a state of equilibrium. Next up is Anaximenes, and he took a different view than either of his contemporaries. He proposed that everything in the world is made up of the same kind of stuff, and that that one thing condensed and increased in its density, or rarefied, which is reduced in its density, to make everything we see in the world. And if this sounds a little bit familiar to you, it should. The idea that all matter is made up of the same basic thing is one of the basics of atom theory, which anybody with a high school education should know all about. To Anaximenes, though, this thing that everything was made of was air, and it was alive, and when rarefied it made fire, and condensed it made first water, then earth, then stone, and so on and so forth. He even had evidence to support this claim. Go ahead and close your lips into a tight circle and let out a breath on your hand. See, it's cool. Now open your mouth wide and do the same thing. It's warm. Breath, when expanded, is warmer, which brings it closer to fire. Next up is Pythagoras, who I'm sure a lot of you remember from math class. He founded a cult. A math cult. The Pythagoreans, as they were called, sought to replicate the beauty of the universe in their own souls, and thus achieve salvation. Salvation in this case being escape from the cycle of reincarnation that they believed they were a part of. This was new, because it meant that they philosophized not out of mere curiosity, but out of supposed benefit to themselves. Now it's important to note that as a cult leader, all of the cult's discoveries were attributed to Pythagoras himself, which makes it hard to decipher what he did as opposed to his followers. But we know some things for certain. We know that they viewed the world as numbers or a scale. This was inspired by the musical scale. In the same way that numbers bring order and beauty to music, supposedly they did so to life. The Pythagoreans also made incredible contributions to mathematics, but as far as we're concerned, their most important contribution was the idea of a dualistic universe. All of the opposites of the world were separated into two groups. And Plato and Aristotle referenced this view a couple of times in the works that we're going to be going over later. On the one hand was limited, 
one, right, male, rest, straight, light, good, and square. On the other hand was unlimited, even, many, left, female, motion, curved, dark, bad, and oblong. This view seems to have been inspired in part by the gnomon representation of numbers. It was a graphic representation of the numeric system that when you started with one, let you make every odd number up to infinity. And when you started with two, let you make every even number. Now the graph for one produces a square shape. Naturally, this also means that the ratio of side to side is always one to one. And that's true no matter how big the square gets. The diagram for two and even numbers, on the other hand, produces a rectangle, and the ratio of side to side changes with every number. Next up is Heraclitus. Now, to him, the main principle of existence was something called the Logos, which takes the shape of an ever-living fire that continually burns itself out, producing land and water, which in turn burn to feed it. In Heraclitus's world, everything is in a constant state of opposition and flux, with the Logos maintaining balance at each and every moment. This idea that the universe maintains itself through this balance of conflict, enemies sustaining each other even as they war against each other, greatly influenced Heraclitus's successors. Though this idea has more or less died out scientifically, it's very prevalent even today in, in literature and other media. Next are the Eleatics, Parmenides and Zeno. Parmenides' poem, The Way of Truth, defines the world using a simple disjunction. It is, or it is not. Thus, the idea that mortal minds have of things coming into being and going away is inherently wrong. If something is capable of being thought of, then clearly it is. And that means, therefore, that it has no beginning and no end. It just is. That means that anything in the sensible world that we believe has a beginning and an end doesn't exist. Because to say that something begins, exists, and then ends and ceases to exist is tantamount to saying it is and it is not, which ultimately just boils down to it is not. In place of this view, he sets forth a, a one being, ungenerated, unchanging, indestructible, and shaped as a sphere. What he is objecting to here is plurality and change. He's saying that something cannot simply come into being and then vanish from existence, and that if something appears to do that, the error lies within our perceptions of it. Now this is an incredibly important contribution to philosophic thought, because while it may sound ridiculous, it poses the question, how can something come into existence and then leave existence? Because it's accepted by most that, that we can only conceive of things that are. Now, I'm sure that most of you will agree that an unreal, sensible world is as ridiculous as it is useless. I mean, even if the world is unknowable and everything that we see is an illusion, there has to be something there to generate the illusion in the first place. And that means that every philosopher who came after Heraclitus had to answer that question in some way. And in this way, it sets the foundation for Platonism by delineating between opinion and knowledge, appearance and reality. The next philosopher is Zeno, who was a younger contemporary of Heraclitus. Now, he never actually put forth any hypotheses of his own. Most of his time was spent refuting the ideas of others, particularly any works that opposed Eleatic monism. That is to say, Heraclitus. Next up are the pluralists, Empedocles, Anaxagoras, Leucippus, and Democritus. Empedocles sought to reconcile Parmenides' problem of coming to be and going away by combining the Parmenidean complete sphere of being into four opposing elements, hot, cold, wet, and dry, hearkening back to Anaximander. These elements exist in permanence, but combine in different ways, under the direction of the cosmic forces of love and strife, to make everything in this sensible world. Different elements combining in different ways. It sounds like something you've heard in science class, doesn't it? Anyways, next is Anaxagoras. He proposed a similar theory, 
that ingenerable, indestructible elements combine and mix to create everything we see. How they mixed is somewhat convoluted and not really very clear. He uses both the principle called homoeomerity, the idea that any substance is composed wholly of like parts, and a principle that states that everything contains portions of everything else. The best account of how to combine these two seemingly opposing points is to assume that they refer to different things. The first says that no matter what you do to, say, a bar of gold, it will still be gold. You can cut it in half, you can cut it into little itty bitty pieces, but it's always going to be gold. The second point says that gold itself has within it portions of the elements that make up everything. As in some part hot, some part cold, wet, dry, light, dark, etc. And finally we come to Leucippus and Democritus. They were known as the atomists, and if you listen to their theories you can see why. Now they actually rejected part of Parmenides' claims. They maintained that not being exists just as much as being, on the grounds that material things, things that exist, exist alongside space, entirely separate, but existent all the same. You see, Parmenides equates existence with material existence. The atomists reject that. They say that there is material existence, and then there is space, which may or may not be empty. They postulated that the world consists of tiny, tiny, indivisible particles that move through empty space, and that these particles bore certain characteristics, and things like color, feel, and sounds are secondary qualities that came about based on how these characteristics of the particles interact with our senses. Also of note is that unlike the other ideas we've gone over so far, the atomists never postulated a controlling agent, such as mind or logos. Rather, these particles move without any apparent cause.